I think sound is a really dominant sense for animals underwater. Uh, and that's because underwater, the world is completely different to how, how we're used to in air, right? Like you're, we're used to being able to see for miles where, wherever we are really. Whereas if you go underwater, even if the water is really, really clear, you can't see more than about 20 or 30 meters. And so for anything that an animal underwater, whenever it needs information about something that's further than 10 meters away, it's likely to be using sound rather than sight as its primary sense of information gathering about the world around it. Hi, I'm Marcy Trent Long. Welcome to Season 13, Asia's Noisy Oceans. And I'm Stella Chen. Our team and Sustainable Asia partner with China Dialogue to produce this new season. Our oceans are a marvel of marine creatures that are battling human influence of all sorts, particularly near our coastlines. But a feature of this underwater world that people are just starting to understand is the ecosystem of sound that makes life under the sea possible. Yes, because as marine biologist Timothy Gordon just told us, visibility underwater is so limited that aquatic animals rely much more on sound than they do on sight. In this season, we'll uncover how marine life uses sound to communicate, reproduce, move around, and feed themselves by following Timothy Gordon as he researches the acoustic world of the clamorous coral reefs. Then we'll turn to how human-induced noise pollution is creating havoc with this acoustic life of marine animals underwater. To illustrate this, we'll look at what has been done in China, specifically in Hong Kong and along the southern coast, to solve the noise pollution that has been endangering native dolphin species in the region. So first, let's go to the Great Barrier Reef, the world's largest coral reef that stretches over 2,300 kilometers off the northern coast of Australia. Teeming with life, a healthy coral reef is one of the noisiest places in the ocean. And for researchers like Tim Gordon, using sound recordings around these reefs help gauge the health of their ecosystems, since the reefs tend to go quiet as animals abandon them when conditions aren't suitable. And with climate change and noise pollution impacts on marine life there, creating a timeline of recordings of this underwater acoustic world not only helps identify these impacts, but it also helps researchers generate mitigation strategies to protect marine life from these human-induced alterations. And that's where Tim comes in. He's still a PhD student at the University of Exeter, but his explanation of this underwater acoustic world are so vivid that his speaking engagements have garnered him numerous YouTube views. Maybe this is because Timothy has been dreaming about working as a marine biologist at the Great Barrier Reef since he was a boy. Growing up, I was always fascinated by uh, the natural world around me and particularly wild animals. I was never really much of a pets kid, but I was really into uh, exploring wild places and understanding more about uh, wild animals and how they live their life and these fantastically diverse ecosystems. You know, I knew all of the David Attenborough documentaries back to front and upside down and I had all the posters of these places, including the Great Barrier Reef up on my bedroom wall. Going through school and then university, I you know, learned more and more about these places but had never been. Uh, and then had this magic opportunity at the start of studying a PhD on coral reef ecology uh, to go and study the Great Barrier Reef, which for me was like a, a childhood's dream come true, right? It's this place I'd heard so much about, studied so much in lecture theatres in the UK, uh, to then be 
um, on my way there with a, a bag full of scientific equipment to take measurements and, and record the sounds of this you know, world famous coral reef was, was really, really exciting for me. I spend a third of my year in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef collecting data, running experiments underwater uh, and, and then bring all that data back home to the UK for the other two thirds of the year to analyse it and publish the results. In 2016, when Tim started his PhD, he began by examining how warming seas influence coral reef ecosystems by using acoustic rather than visual measurements. Since most of the data Tim collected was acoustic, he realized more and more the importance of sound to life on the reef. So almost all animals on a coral reef, they hatch from an egg on the reef, and then almost immediately they're swept out into the open ocean. And out there they grow up and they develop for the first few weeks of their life, but then they have to come back to a coral reef as juveniles and, and resettle on a reef. And the, one of the dominant ways that from distance they're able to sense a reef and start to swim towards a reef and then ultimately decide whether that's a reef they want to stay on or not uh, is the sound of the reef. Because so, so many animals on the reef are using sound that it creates this really loud, rich, diverse soundscape full of, you, you know, the pops and the crackle of invertebrates and the whoops and the grunts and the crunches of fish. Um, and there's, there's this sort of, it's the loudest ecosystem in the sea, the coral reef. And so you can hear it from some distance off. Uh, and these animals are using that sound to cue in, come towards the reef and decide to settle there. So once the marine animals set up their home on the coral reef, then what? Of course, once they've settled on the reef, in turn they become part of the soundscape itself. They start to use sound to communicate with each other. Uh, to alarm call, to warn each other of coming danger, um, to, to advertise their presence and to defend a territory from, you know, would-be intruders. They, they make sounds inadvertently as well, you know, as they're feeding, as they're crunching through the coral or grazing on algae. Uh, and so loads of these different animals, all the way from the tiny little shrimps, all the way up to the really big fish and, and some of the mammals and the reptiles that you find on reefs. Uh, they're all making different sounds, all, if you like, they're like different players and different instruments in an orchestra, all contributing to this massive big biological sound. And what about mating? Some of the best David Attenborough footage is watching the antics of males trying to get the female's attention. Do marine life do that through sound as well? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the um, dominant events in a lot of underwater animals' lives is, is the breeding cycle. And sound plays an important role in that as well. So we, we find that um, associated with sort of courtship and, and advertising themselves to a mate, there's often uh, sound production. So loads of the damselfish, which are the most common type of fish on a coral reef, they're these little colourful fish that hold their territories. Um, and they'll, they'll do these dances to sort of advertise themselves to females. The males will hold a territory and they'll, they'll swim up and down really rapidly. And when they get to the top of that um, sort of dance, if you like, at the highest point on their swimming route within this dance, they'll make this sort of series of pops and then they'll swim back down again and then rapidly swim up and make a load of pops and swim down again. Uh, and, and so that's the, them trying to attract a mate. And uh, yeah, it's an amazing thing to see and hear. And, and then at the same time as that sort of dancing, you get these ag aggressive uh, territorial defences, which are also associated with um, reproductive territories and breeding opportunities. Uh, so these little fish will become very, uh, very territorial, very protective over their little patch of reef. And so sometimes even if you swim past as a human, they'll, they'll want to, you know, kick you out. They're kicking everybody out of their territory. And so they'll swim together and they'll, they'll bash their teeth together as they as they come at you and you get this sort of aggressive chatter in your ear as this little fish comes careering towards you, you know, get off my land type thing. <laughs> well, it's pretty clear that there is a lot to be learned about the behavior of the underwater ecosystem just by listening. It makes me wonder, does the soundscape of the coral reefs also change throughout the day? One of the the dominant sound you always hear any time of day uh, is snapping shrimp on a coral reef. Uh, 
and they, as thousands of these shrimp are all clicking their claws together, it creates this sort of background crackling sound. It sounds like when you fry bacon or, um, or like the static when your radio isn't tuned properly. It sounds something like that. And you'll always hear that in the background. But it turns out when you measure the volume of that sound throughout a 24 hour cycle, it has really clear peaks and troughs. So it will be very loud around uh, sunset and around sunrise. It's at its loudest. And it's louder in the nighttime than it is in the daytime. Different fish that you hear will be really distinct at different times as well. So I did one study where I, I recorded throughout the day, um, 24 hours round the clock uh, on a coral reef. And then I listened back to the recordings at different times, some in the night, some in the morning, some in the afternoon. And it, I was amazed how distinct it is. It's like listening to a completely different ecosystem. <laughs> There were some that was like late afternoon, early evening, that's it. You're not hearing that sound any other time. These animals, in, in the same way that they all have their own little space in the reef that they'll live in, and you'll know oh, you're only going to find that animal, you know, associated with these corals or, or down on the bottom or up near the surface of the water. In the same way, they only ever have their own type of noise and time of day that they will produce that noise as well. So, you know, in this, as well as sharing the space on a reef, it's almost like these animals are sharing the acoustic space within the day of a reef. That seems like an orchestra, as if the marine animals know when it's their turn to chime in. Yeah, we, we, we find the same sort of thing with birds and also with bats. You know, the, the scientific term for it is acoustic niche partitioning. And what that means is that b between them all, the animals have worked out which, which is their niche. If I sing at this particular pitch and I sing at this particular time of day and nobody else goes there, so that's all right, I can be heard. Whereas if you're trying to sing, you know, the same sort of sound at the same sort of time as, as a different type of animal, you're going to get in each other's way. You're not going to be able to communicate as effectively because, you, you know, you won't be able to hear over the din of that, that very similar noise. And so we see it on coral reefs, we see it in forests, we see it in lots of different ecosystems that sharing the acoustic space and, and deliberately choosing to make noises of, of types and at times of day uh, that other animals aren't using uh, is, is the key to success in the, the acoustic world of animal behaviour, I guess. So we can start to get kind of a sound map for the activities of marine life and begin to understand how dependent these underwater animals are on sound. Developing this recorded data helped him piece together his research findings that a healthy reef is a noisy reef. But when Tim first started his research, some parts of the Great Barrier Reef were silent. Suffering from the impact of climate change, the first place he visited has bleached coral reefs void of life. He explained more in this YouTube video. At the start of my PhD, I listened to reefs. I compared how they sounded five years ago to how they sound today. And it was the saddest thing I've ever heard. The great animal orchestra of the reef has been replaced by the sounds of silence. To test the implications of that, I set up an experiment where I made a lot of fake coral reefs all around a bay, and I played either the sound of healthy reefs from five years ago, or the sound of today's degraded reefs, and I counted the number of fish that heard their way home onto my reefs. And what I found were there were far fewer fish arriving back when I played the sound of today's reefs. That's very worrying because those are the fish of the future. Those fish need to make it home. Tim was using sound to understand more about the impacts of warming waters on marine life. This makes me wonder how else the kind of recordings he was gathering might be useful to other marine biologists. There's been research papers actually where in areas where it's difficult to dive or where visibility is bad or, or where there's, you know, it's not possible to go there very often. People try and leave underwater microphones there to count the parrotfish in the area just by listening to the number of crunching bite sounds you can hear on the surrounding reef. In fact, in one of our earlier seasons called 1986, we talked about how marine ranching, a form of aquaculture in the open ocean, uses microphone sensors and acoustic data to help count fish populations. Marine ranching is growing in popularity, especially in China. 
So using recording equipment for monitoring aquaculture seems to make sense. But for researchers that want to cover a more expansive territory of the ocean, that sounds kind of costly. The other thing that we've been pursuing as a research team is that we're trying to find ways of doing this very cheaply because we feel like listening underwater is quite a valuable thing for people to be able to do. And so we would like to, for more people to be able to be involved in it. So we've been trialing these very low cost microphones. So one idea is using GoPros or other sports cameras that lots of people already have access to. Uh, those cameras record sound and they're waterproof. So we've been taking recordings using those cameras and comparing them to the the high quality recordings made by very expensive hydrophones and, and testing, you know, what's the difference in quality? Can you still get something valuable from these, these cheaper devices? Um, and, and people are doing similar with cheap microphones in rainforests. So we're using the same technology that they use there, uh, putting waterproof cases around it and then putting it underwater and s seeing if it works as well. Tim wants to take his research and the acoustic data he has been gathering beyond just understanding what's happening to the world's coral reefs. He explains the next step in his YouTube video. And that's why I'm interested in the future soundtrack of the Great Barrier Reef. How can we use acoustics not just as a sad symptom of the decline of coral reefs, but as a tool to promote their recovery? If reefs aren't loud enough, can we amplify them using loudspeakers? If we know which the key, the loudest organisms on reefs are, can we promote their conservation? And if reefs can't be heard, can we reduce other sources of noise pollution in the ocean to make them audible from further distances? In fact, Tim recently co-wrote a paper stating that degraded reefs smell and sound less attractive to settlement stage fish. The research paper published in Nature Communications went on to prove that playback of healthy reef sounds can increase fish settlement and retention to degraded coral reef habitat. Underwater acoustic data is being used worldwide to combat the diminishing habitat that warming seas are creating in our ocean. For example, microphones attached to buoys have been placed near the coastline of the US and Canada to monitor the location of endangered right whales to reduce the risk of ship strike. There's still so much we have to learn about the undersea world compared to what we already know about life on land. And the world of acoustics, the fascinating sounds that marine life use just to survive, is opening up new ways to measure and analyze underwater ecosystems. So that's the good news. The world of ocean sounds is now open and it's becoming an established field for marine research. The bad news is that, now that we realize the importance of acoustic communication amongst underwater animals, we start to fully understand how human-induced noise pollution in the ocean wreaks havoc on life under the sea. In our next episode, we'll turn back to our home in Hong Kong to talk about the impact of noise pollution on marine life there and elsewhere in China. Specifically, how dolphin species are struggling to survive with surging development around their habitat and how researchers and activists are trying to find solutions. Next in episode two. This season is produced by Sustainable Asia in partnership with China Dialogue. It was hosted by me, Marcy Trent Long, and Stella Chen. Bonnie Ao was producer, alongside associate producers Stella Chen and Wu Yu Fei. Audio editing by Avery Choi. Rachel Lee managed the translations, and Lizzie Hessling from China Dialogue served as our commissioning editor. Alexander Mobison created the intro-outro music made from repurposed and recovered waste items. If you like what you hear, please tune in to Sustainable Asia's new show, Green Bites. You get all the news about Asia and the environment in 10 short-minute bites each week. The name of it again is Green Bites.